Let's talk about some other items that the underwriter could probably run into. Once again, common, but not very common. All right. Now, I must start this section by saying and declaring publicly, I am not a practicing attorney. But I did sleep in a Holiday Inn Express last night. <laughs> That's an act, that joke's getting old because it's gone away and some of the younger people are looking at me like, what? <laughs> like Scooby-Doo, <"Hur?" laughs> I'm not an attorney, so this is not legal advice. Don't construe it as legal advice. This are, these are things that I know and have talked to underwriters to confirm. So when they're dealing with probate, and probate is when somebody passes away. They die, testate is the word, all right? There are many documents that that underwriter is going to seek. Now, probably, probably, underwriters are also not attorneys. That's why most title companies have an attorney on call or in the office or on their board for probably things like this. Because as you can see on the screen up front, <clears throat> and for those of you at home on your screen, you can see there are multiple documents that this underwriter may have to sort through to make sure the format's correct, make sure they're executed correctly, make sure they have all the correct names on it, make sure they have all the names that should be on it. So I don't believe that underwriters would undergo this section without some kind of outside guidance. Uh, and that guidance could come in the form of direct contact with an attorney. That guidance could come in the fact that the attorney may review these himself, or it could be a checklist of things that they have to do. So they've got like the will they're going to have to look at. Uh, they're gonna to have to have any court orders that are admitted. Uh, letters of testamentary. Testamentary means uh, they have died and those are documents, testamentary like a, a trust that is created in a will is a testamentary trust. It means they died testate with a will. They may have uh, state and federal tax documents. Uh, they may have final orders of the state, the petitions of letters, final decree, proof of publication, any court final orders. There's a whole bunch of documents. This list on the screen is not to be exhaustive, by the way. There may be other things that uh, we're not aware of, even I'm not aware of, and I'm the one doing the class, all right, because I'm not an attorney. And then if there happens to be problems in that estate, there could be dozens of other documents. I mean, if heirs start fighting, if an heir pops up that was you know, oh, there's three boys and only two are still alive. And the one pops up from South America and says, no, I'm still alive. I want my... So there's all kinds of issues uh, when dealing with probate matters. Very, very difficult. So what the takeaway is for you guys is that if you're dealing with title insurance in an estate or in a probate manner, just basically tell them it's not easy. All right. Don't worry about memorizing all the forms. Oh, do you have the heir of documentation or the final decree of heirship? Uh, no, just say, you know, our attorney or main office will gather all the documents that they need. That's the best way to look at it, all right? If it's an estate and the in company is insuring the transaction, there may have to be a personal representative of the estate, typically called the executor, that conveys the property. Well, if that's the case, you're actually going to need proof that that executor is who they say they are. I have had many cases where the seller has gone through the process and right up until signing, He's like, well, actually, my sister's the executor. I've just been helping her out. Dude, you screwed up. You screwed the pooch on this because now we haven't got the right documents. We haven't got the right signatures. That was mainly on the listing of the real estate side caused a problem. 
Uh, so we kind of headed it off before it got to you guys. But that's something that will need to be proven. Somebody steps up and says, yes, it's my mother's house. She has passed away. I'm the executor for my brother and I. Great. That's nice. Can you prove it? I need the documentation, i.e. her will, and that's going to have to be given to the underwriter so that the underwriter can actually prove that Raymond is the executor of his mother's will and it's not Kenneth or some third party attorney that she may have appointed. All right. So that document that appoints me as the executor is going to have to be recorded along with all the other documents. Now, take a side note here, not on the screen, but understand that anytime there's a corporation or a trust where, the, where there are actually living entities that can own property, corporations are an artificial person. They are allowed to own property, all right? If, the cor if it's a sale from a corporation, you're gonna need very similar document for the person who ever signs for that. All right. So if, you know, for example, uh, Real University Inc. owns the school. If we, well, we don't own this building. We own another building, which is a whole other story, but don't get me started. <laughs> but I'm not bitter. <laughs> um, there's going to have to be proof that Raymond Modulin is the CEO and can sign for Real University Inc. So it's the same kind of document. That proof is going to be needed as well. If it's a trust, the trustee that is signs for the, on the deed may have to have proof that he is in fact the trustee. So anytime you're dealing with this artificial person that someone else is signing for, estates, trusts, corporate sales, understand that there's going to be at least one other document validating that the person signing has the authority to sign for that trust or that estate or that corporation okay so keep that in mind the underwriter is going to be requesting those and will be needing those as well and probably will record them in the transaction if there are heirs to the property um, there's going to be identified heirs to the property. Um, make sure that all of the all of the heirs to the will are in fact signing in some manner. And I say in some manner because I have seen one heir give power of attorney to another heir so that that heir actually controlled, didn't own, but controlled two of the three portions. All right. It was like a brother, a sister, and the kid's uh, nephew. And the nephew was of minor age. So there were three signers or three, and the one had control. So just understand that if there's heirs involved, you're going to need all of the heirs to be on that documentation. Uh, you're going to also need to have them sign. If there is an heir missing, then there's problems because now we've got to go research, find that error, have them sign in some fashion, maybe through a, a mobile notary in another state or whatever. They can contest that sale if they're not on the, if they're not, signature is not valid. I, I don't know what I'm trying to say here. If they don't get that third signature, Say they can't find him. He's in Buenos Aires in the jungle on a missionary trip. All right. There could be a, con a contestation or he could contest the sale because he didn't sign his portion of the property away in the sale. Can be very problematic. Most of the time it's not real problematic, but the fact that there are multiple signers causes a problem out of the gate anyway. So keep that in mind. So those are two other common issues underwriters have to deal with is foreclosures and uh, uh, we already did that one, right? <laughs> Estates, heirs, wills, uh, corporations, trusts, all of those things are going to be problematic.
All right? Take a break.